Dear LLSP alumni, I guess I should say alumni, now that we have some men who've completed the 2020 virtual LLP. Welcome to the eighth program of our 2020 Lunch and Learn series. Our guest today, Ms. Naurin Khaliq, is the newest member of the Karama board. She serves as our treasurer and head of the finance committee. Ms. Khaliq is also a member of the 2020 virtual LLP cohort board. <clears throat> Okay. So, Naureen, since you are a newly minted alumna, please tell me or tell us a bit about your experience with the virtual LLSP or LLP, I should say. Thank you, Sarah. Um, first, I'd like to say, well, thank you for having me today and thank you for accepting me as a member of your board. I'm really enjoying my time since um, earlier this year being on the board of Karama. Brave um, woman. <laughs> I'm glad for punishment. <laughs> now that I know. <laughs> um, I actually truly tr really did enjoy LLP. I did, I will say, reflecting back on it, I, um, I wish I had allowed myself more time to delve even deeper into it, but I think it was a great um, introduction into what Karama, ha all the services Karama has to provide, right? The network opportunities, the ability to tap into some very, very um, deep rooted, deep knowledge, knowledgeable people who have really, um, yeah, I, I'm amazed every day by the caliber of people that we have associated with Karama. So I think the ability to be able to tap into that knowledge base was amazing. Um, I, like I said, I really, really enjoyed um, enjoyed it and I felt it was um, accessible, right? So I could, even during this COVID environment, being stuck in your dining room as the, as the office, as I am even today when I, when I work from home, um, but being able to access the, um, the materials and the community and to be able to get the information, I think that's a huge benefit. Um, you know, it's, we, we, there are not too many benefits with COVID, but I think some of the, um, we, we are seeing some benefits in right, uh, allowing um, this conference to be virtual and accessible around the world at a very reasonable price. It's a humongous benefit. Um, mm -hmm. so I think overall, I had a very positive experience and I look forward, to, look forward to next year, even if we only did it, even if we did it um, live, which I would love to go and physically meet people, I would absolutely do it uh, again virtually. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was thinking about that because originally when you and I met, you and I were both looking forward to attending the real live three week in place, in person LLSP complete with visits to the Supreme Court and to the offices of Congress people who, you know, have heard of Karama's work and the day trip up to Philadelphia and, you know, all of that stuff that goes along with, plus the opportunity to, to talk with our cohort uh, members um, at a more leisurely pace. I mean, I, since I also took this year's LLP with you, I would agree with you that I felt that we, we had a lot of information to digest within a fairly narrow band of time made of, so I guess this was our first one. I think it was really good. I think we now need to maybe tweak it a little bit. Have you been in touch with any of the members of our cohort? Has anybody written to you or uh, been in touch on LinkedIn? No, I had connected with a couple people on LinkedIn, but that was the extent of it. It was just a connection, but not any follow-up since then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I have not had, I don't know where the time goes. I'm retired and yet I feel like I never have time to do half the things that are on my to-do list. And one of them was actually to reach out to more of the people who took LLP with me um, yeah, on LinkedIn and, uh, you know, try to communicate with them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. So if you had to say, and I don't want, you know, it's like, which of your children is your favorite? Well, whichever one I'm talking to. But, but if you had to choose the uh, speaker or course or section of the course that you found to be most where you learned the most which what would that be for you i think from a learning standpoint for me personally i would say the um i'm uh, abed's um on sharia whiz 
I think the 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 legal the you know I think and I will say it, say this it's uh, for me personally right I think growing up in the U.S. especially the sh just the word Sharia doesn't necessarily have a positive connotation. And so when, when you first hear about it, I'm like, well, what does this really mean? I think learning more about that and then learning about the, whole, the inheritance laws that he went over, the, um, you know, setting up your will, that, that intrigued me a lot. Um, and something mm -hmm. that I, it's on my to-do list to go, mm -hmm. go onto his website and sign up for that. Mm -hmm. It's really fun if you just go up there and use the calculator. It's I amazing. Did yeah. I, I did that. To me. Was on, I had fun messing around with that. Exactly. I mean, it's just, it reminds us of how flexible, it's like Abed says, it's an epistemology of, she has an epistemology of how you approach all of these really important questions for how you live your life. And it's, and it's very discursive and it's interactive and that Sharia Wiz calculator is fascinating because if you change the parameters, you come out with some very interesting and different mm -hmm. um, outcomes. And that allows you then to think about how the different schools of uh, Sharia approach essentially the same question, a person dies leaving the following family members, how do you distribute the estate? And you realize there's actually a lot of flexibility built into the process. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. It's a living thing. I personally, would have to say that the, the part that I found most intriguing um, was the section on, um, on leadership. And in particular, I wish we'd had more time to talk about actual case studies of invisible yeah. leadership. You know, I mean, okay, I think I sort of generally have an idea of what we're talking about here, but that was an area where I wished we'd had more time or perhaps case studies or perhaps the opportunity to put together a follow-up two or three part course that would flesh out this idea of leadership mm -hmm. a bit further so that that i think to me would would have been one of the things that i thought was the most amazing yeah, Dr. Hickman so, was a great speaker. I've, I've attended lots of leadership training and education classes in my career, um, you know, being in, in the corporate world for so long. And she was, an, I will say, re you know, relative to the other speakers and um, classes that I've attended, she's an excellent speaker and um, has provides lots of really good information. So I, I'd agree with you. Perhaps that's something we can look into for a future follow-up course. Mm -hmm. I'm even thinking we ought to have her help us talk to the board of Karama because we are building up. It would be really interesting to have an outsider look at our board and maybe give us some, have us all discuss what we mean by leadership and whether it's something that's invested in one person or in the organization as a whole and how we can create that dynamic sense of a shared purpose inside Karama. I, because I serve on the nominations committee, I always, I'm always worried about how we can find people who will mesh and, you know, be able to pull together as a team in yep. the same direction. So, well, I just move off in another direction now for a moment. And Noreen, tell me a little bit more about your own background, where you grew up, when you came to the States, and, or were you born here? I was not. I was born in Pakistan. <clears throat> uh, we we uh, came to the U.S. when I was about eight years old with mm. uh, my parents and at that time five brothers. Um, we had a sister that was born a year later in the, in the U.S. Um, my dad was uh, worked for the Pakistan embassy. He was an accountant. Mm. He was a defense, uh, an accountant on uh, defense matters at the Pakistani embassy in Washington, D.C. So we moved to the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and I still live in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I never left. Um, I, came, I started third grade here in the U.S., um, and then we acclimated pretty well into, uh, you know, if you call it the American culture, um, but we had a very strong um, influence from our parents from, you know, being Pakistani Muslim family. So it was very strongly influenced by, by their up upbringing and the way they wanted to raise us. But like I said, we acclimated relatively well into the, um, the American culture. Most of the places where we lived when I was growing up, we lived in very heavily um, 
immigrant full families, right? So it, the communities were, um, had lots of immigrant families. So it, there was a lot of diversity um, in, in the Falls Church community in, 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 in this area. And then in my year, my senior year of high school, we moved out further into the suburbs and there was a little bit less diversity. So I think where my kids grow up, I think they see a lot less diversity than when I went, where I was growing up. The high school I went to was like the most diverse high school in the entire country. Um, so I think it's uh, that for sure influences how I raise my children, but also how I approach things and how I view opportunities and how I view um, our standing in, in the community here. Mm. That's very interesting. Your mother was a stay-at-home mom or did, was she also a professional? She was a stay-at-home mom and then she, um, she did other work while she stayed at home. Like she would babysit or she would cook for people, but she, she, she contributed to the family. As, you, as I said, we had a very large family, right? So, but she was a stay-at-home mom. Far be it from me to imply that a woman who isn't earning money isn't working <laughs> because with, what was it, five brothers plus two sisters, yeah. that's a, uh, just thinking of the meals she must have been churning out because I'm sure people also, you bring friends home from school, so yeah. she was probably cooking for 15 people every day. <laughs> yeah. MashaAllah, she could have, she could have gone on to open and run her own restaurant. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. Um, and now, how did you meet your husband? So um, it's, I would say, semi-arranged marriage. Um, my husband um, is from Pakistan, so mm -hmm. our families are connected. And uh, when I was a uh, junior in high school, we went back to Pakistan and our families were, uh, had known each other my, our entire lives. And um, there was a suggestion, I guess, from when we were younger, when I was living there, that we would one day get married. And so we said, okay, well, I'll get to know him this summer. We spent the summer and got to know each other and then got married at the end of that summer. And it seems like it took. <laughs> because it's here been, you are. <laughs> it's been tw last week, it was 27 years, mashallah. Mashallah. <laughs> Happy anniversary. <laughs> Well, if you happen to know a nice boy, let me know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't think my daughter would pay any attention, I'm telling you. Do you think that these semi-arranged marriages are something that that the Muslim community in the United States would be, uh, you know, well advised to consider? Or do we just let our children, and, and this is obviously very personal because especially now you have a boy who's just gone off to university for his second year. Um, do you think about how you introduce your children to appropriate, you know, mates? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's, it's this, and we do think about it. And I think the way we're approaching it is we would let our children decide for themselves. I think we raise them and, and hope they, they see what we value. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they value the same thing. And at the end of the day, they have to make their own life decisions and they, it's, it's their life to live. Um, so I'm more of a proponent that I'm here to help them. If they come to me and they ask me, hey, can you help step me up? Can you go find me, find me the love of my life? I'm happy to help. But it's not something that I would, um, I would in, initiate, I don't think. I think that the way mm -hmm. I would approach is I'm not going to initiate it. I've always said to them, um, you know, be happy, have lots of friends and and you know find your own find your own mates and your own happiness mm -hmm. god knows i don't think there's an easy answer one way or the other so but i'm here to getting by. Really guide but i don't want to mm -hmm. impose right well but i don't think you felt as if your marriage was imposed on you so much as there was this possibly this sort of seed planted back when you were children and yeah, but I think it's different because I think it was also um, growing up with, you know, first generation immigrants, it was a little bit different where it was they, it was, yes, it was suggest, it was strong suggestions. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if I rebelled and said, no, I'm not doing this, the outcome may have been different. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. Yeah. Was that sort of the same for the rest of your siblings, a sort of strong suggestion that this person might be a person for, you know, to take a second look at or no. are they allowed to go it, their way? I think, yeah, I think it's, it, it's a mix. I think of a, so I have, um, I have a brother who's married someone from Sweden. I have a brother who's married someone from, who's American. I have my sister's husband's from Bangladesh. Um, and then to my other three brothers are married to 
women from Pakistan, two that were sort of arranged from Pakistan and one that he went to college with here. So it's a mix, yeah. right? We got one of everything. <laughs> right. Oh, well, it, right. you know, you, you, you come from a mixed family. <laughs> so getting back to you. So you grew up here pretty much. I mean, eight, you know, you, you in terms of acculturation, you know, you, you came at the right age to go to school and become acculturated. And then you went on to university. So how did you end up in accounting? What, what was the thinking there? How did you end up in your field? So interestingly, I actually, when I was in college, I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> so I, uh, I, was, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to go to law school. I worked for uh, an attorney at an, in, in, a, um, in Fairfax for all four years of, while I was going to college. And I really wanted, I was like, I want to be a lawyer. But when I worked at the attorney's office, I actually did accounting work. Um, and I applied to the business school at, at, um, at George Mason. And it was, uh, my father was an accountant. So mm -hmm. it was not far fetched for me to go, go down this route. I initially, I fought it initially. And I was like, okay, I want to go to law school. And my dad was like, well, do you realize how many lawyers live in the DC area? You want to get into work the where you're you'll be able to find a job I'm like yeah I guess I should think of it think about that too and I still fought the accounting and I said well I'm not going to be an accountant either I will be I'll go into finance so I actually was wow. a finance major okay. I graduated with a finance degree but I ended up taking jobs in accounting because I felt you know I needed the um, strong accounting in order to make me a better better um uh, analysts in, in the finance world. Right. But as I worked more and more in accounting, I actually enjoyed and loved that so much more. And then it wasn't that long ago in 2010 that I decided that I wanted to be as, um, you know, if I've been working in accounting for so long, there's no going back now. So I may as well make it official and, you know, make myself a legitimate accountant. Well, what do I need to do that? I need to be a CPA. Okay. But in order for me to do that, I looked at the credentials that you needed to even sit for the exam. Yes, I needed yes. so many classes that I was like, well, I may as well get a master's degree instead of going wow. and getting a certificate. So then I went back to school at American University. I got a master's in accounting, which allowed me to have the, uh, the credits I needed to sit for the CPA exam. And I sat for the CPA exam, passed that back 2012. So I haven't been an official CPA for very long, even though I've worked in accounting for you know, over 25 years. Yeah. And I love it. I actually do. I, I love what I do. I love um, the leadership roles I've had. I, I find, you know, I, I'm drawn to it. So you feel that getting that, those three letters actually opened up doors for you, even though you were doing a lot of work um, I think already. Does for you, yeah, I think what it does for you, the experience by far, and as a hire now, right, I always look for the experience. The experience by far is, is, is um, speaks to, to your credentials and what you can do more than anything else. What those three letters help you do is just it, it helps open, it helps open doors, right? Uh -huh. So um, thankfully for me in my entire career, almost every single job I've had, I've had because I knew the person. I knew either them or they knew of me and had experience with them at a different company or in a different role mm -hmm. and it was not you know they didn't even have to bat an eye like yep we're hiring you like the job I'm in right now I reached out to the guy a year and a half ago and I said hey I'm at, I, I left this place I'm looking for a job and he's like oh you come in next week and he, I was pretty much hired on the spot and he actually created the position I'm in he created it after he talked to me he didn't have okay. a position so those three letters it's more of the giving you legitimacy I think I would say mm -hmm. right so it's, it's to someone who doesn't know you it's giving okay. like, it's, it could get you a foot in the door if you needed it. I thankfully haven't had that need, but it's giving you that legitimacy where someone doesn't have to question your credibility. Uh -huh. Well, so. speaking of your working career then, so when you first started out, you started out basically just with a degree in finance, but with experience in accounting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and you started out where for our viewers? I, I worked uh, at U.S. News and World Report. Um, uh -huh. You guys know that magazine that does all the yes. magazines? Yes, yeah, magazine. And uh, they were based in D.C. at the time. They moved since moved to New York. Uh -huh. So I worked there for a couple of years. Um, then I left there and went to MCI, which later became MCI Worldcom. And then they went through a lot of reorganization. So I left that and went to Windstar Communications, which is also still in the telecommunications industry. Then they went bankrupt <laughs> and yeah. I left that and um, I went to Freddie Mac and I was there for five years, which is in the secondary mortgage um, business. And I love that business, the whole secondary fi mortgage finance business. I just love it. I was there for five years. But that was, was that around the time of, no, that was after the big meltdown of, you know, 2008, 9. 
So it was before. It was right oh, before. Oh, it was before. And okay. I was there because they had to go through a very large restatement of their financial results. We had to restate five years of financial Indeed. results for them. And I worked there then. So it was, <laughs> I guess when I said earlier, I'm glad for punishment, is I uh, did that and worked crazy, crazy long hours. But as soon as that ended, I was bored out of my mind. Ah, I was like, I okay. need to do something crazy. So I, a challenge. <laughs> I wanted to leave. And so many of my colleagues had left to go to Fannie Mae because Fannie Mae had just started their restatement. They needed ah. to do something similar to restate their financial results for um, three to three to four years. Mm. And I reluctantly I was like, okay, fine, I'll go. And I went there and I ended up staying there 13 years because I wow. love that work. It's, it, it okay. is really amazing work. But then it gets to a point in time where there's a, there's a, lot, of, um, a lot of politics in corporate culture, mature mm -hmm. organizations and where you can't move certain things forward. So um, it, was, it was time I needed to leave and start and look at, look at something fresh and um, you know, spend more time at home. The, the company, I'm at PenFed. They are definitely much more family friendly. I enjoy the work. I have a great, great boss. I have really good colleagues, some frustrating colleagues, but the really good ones help me keep going every day. <laughs> Nothing's perfect. There's always one or two flies in the ointment, you know. Um, well, I would say, thinking about your career, that you probably have another good five years at, you know, PenFed, and then maybe you'll do something else. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's about right, because by then you'll have two kids just about out of college, right, five years from now? Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be a time to start your own business. I, you know, it's funny. My daughter will ask me, like, what's my dream job? And I often say, I think my dream job would be to go work for um, Doctors Without Borders, but in an accounting role. <laughs> so we'll see if I can find that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Actually, I have a friend, um, oh, I should introduce you, but um, she's ended up working uh, in, uh, not Uganda, um, in, she's in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a circuitous way, but she's basically helping out in the nonprofit sector in Rwanda. So, you know, there are interesting international opportunities for women with your background. I'll have to do the introduction on LinkedIn. Okay, I look forward to that. <laughs> but um, so now you are on the board of Karama and we specifically recruited you as treasurer, but also head of the finance committee. But the thing that really inspired me to root for you and push for you to be asked to come on the board is the fact that you have a background in fundraising. And I wonder if you would share a little bit of your experience with your daughter's rowing club and, and you know, how that has formed your ideas about nonprofits and fundraising and, you know, being creative and also asking. Yeah. So uh, my, my daughter's on the rowing team at her school, and this is her fourth year. She's going to be on that rowing team, and it's very challenging this past year. But it's a, it's a sport that's not funded by our county. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that means is that we, it's a self-funded sport. And it's actually not a very cheap sport, right? The boats cost a lot of money. A new boat, we, had, we bought a new boat last year and it was $45,000 for one Oh boat. my God. Right, so they're, they're not expensive. Then you have insurance for the boats you have to pay for. We do pay our coaches because we want quality coaches who can train um, our children properly, who are credentialed, provide training for the coaches. Uh, we have park fees we have to pay, which is where, where our marina is, where we have a boathouse there where we store our boats, we have to pay fees at the park, we have taxes we need to pay. So there are a lot of expenses that go into running an organization. That organization all said, I think it's about, probably about somewhere $150,000, $175,000 a year to run. Um, and it's, it, like I said, it's not funded by the school at all. It's not funded by the county, it's not funded by the school. And it's funded by um, our fundraising efforts along with um, the dues that each child has to pay in order to join the club. And our dues at our school, we've managed to keep low because of all the fundraising that we do. And to give you some, you know, a relative number, the first year we joined, our dues were 750 per child. And mm -hmm. some might consider that to be very expensive, but well, relative to a school in McLean, it's also in the same county, but they're in a different neighborhood. Theirs is over $3,000 a year. Wow. So in order to keep our costs, our costs down to each child, we have to supplement with fundraising. Mm -hmm. And we do, we did lots of different things. So we tried something, I always have a, a person who's in charge of a ways and means committee and that person uh, coordinates um, a lot of our fundraising efforts. And some of the standard ones that we do is we have restaurant nights, right? We work with our local restaurants to say, hey, if we have people come out eat here on, the, on a specific night, will you give us a portion of your earnings for that night? And so we, we 
it's not a lot, but we get a decent amount there. And I, I, at least once a month, we have a restaurant night at a local restaurant that's um, popular that people can go to and eat. That's uh, that's one. Amazon Smiles is another one. That's one Karama is doing as well. So through Amazon, and it's not a lot, but it's a tiny little bit from every purchase that everybody makes. If they if they put your organization as the beneficiary on on their Amazon account, and then we last year a couple of things we did is we actually, um, well actually I'll go through the one that we do every year that I don't I know people don't like to do, but we do it, it because it brings in the money, which is our letter writing campaign. We do a personal, it was not personalized, but we give a template out to every rower. And we, um, in the first few years, we mandated that they needed to do this. Every person needed to send out at least 12 letters, every rower. And we have anywhere between 75 to 90 rowers on our team in a given year, that they have to send out 12 letters to friends, family, relatives, neighbors, whomever, and tell them, hey, we row for this club. It's not funded by the county or state. We have to raise money. And you'd be amazed. We'll get $5 donations, $10, $20, $100, $200, depending on who, you know, who brings it in. And that ends up being our largest fundraiser that brings in close to $20,000 a year. The second thing that we do um, is we did do this two to three times a year. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it this time, but is we send the kids door to door. We actually just go send our kids door to door in different neighborhoods. And it works really well if it's a rainy, cold day. <laughs> ask, ask for donations. And again, it's small, small dollar donations that can bring in up to um, fifteen thousand dollars for two. Or, if they they usually go out two to three times, they can bring that money in. And so this year we're challenged. We have to be creative. But what other things can we do? Because those types of fundraisers are not going to be possible this year with social distancing, with COVID. So we need to come up with other other ways. And because you know, with a financial slump, it's challenging for people to fork out money, right? They need uh -huh. to be able to save their money and, and we want to be um, cognizant of that as well. Uh -huh. So one of the things we did last year is we um, had asked people to donate used shoes. And one of the, the ladies who was running our fundraising efforts last year, she worked with an organization where for, um, I forget how many it was, how many, 2,000 pairs? I forget how many pairs of shoes we collected and we ended up getting an $1,100 check from this organization. So it, for every, it was shoes we weren't going to use anyway. We we're going to donate somewhere. So you may as well donate it to them. And then they clean them and they send them off to other countries. And um, they, were, they gave us over $1,100 for that. Wow. And then um, we're doing a virtual 5K race this year. So we actually did a <laughs> physical 5K race where they, everyone met at a park and had actually a race. And this year we're doing it virtually. And it's twenty dollars for each person to sign up, but then you can do the race anywhere you want, right? So can, we have people who live in Texas and California, and everyone signing up um, on our website. And it's, so we're just coming up with trying to come up with creative. So ideas. how do you know that they've done it? Do they like give you their Fitbit information? I mean, how do you know they've actually done their five k? Well, here's the thing: it doesn't really matter. They paid us already, right? So from a club's perspective, I don't care if you do it or you don't. You pay when you sign up. Um, it, 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 I think the when people run races is really for them, right? It's 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 a more of a, uh, a moment of pride to say, oh, I finished the five k and this is my time and I beat my time from last time. So the accountability it's into for for a race and for running. The accountability is on the individual. You don't have to necessarily hold them accountable, but we do. We will though. We were um, we're having people submit. I think through online, when, when I registered, I have to go look at how I did all this, but when I registered, I think then I go and tell them what day I read. We have a time window that it's between September 1st, I think until the end of November, though they have to complete this race and they can just submit um, the time that they completed it by. There's no prize oh. for anyone who wins. So it's like I said, it's, it's self accountability. <laughs> Right, right. So as long as they pay the money and, you know, we, we'll take them on faith, but you give them an opportunity to proudly tell you what they've done, which is really good. Uh, it's very wonderful. So if you were talking to someone who wants to become a supporter of Karama specifically, what would you say to them about what's the best way, the easiest way uh, to support Karama? I think the best, well, the easiest by far is through um, Amazon Smiles, unless they're already some, you know, supporting some other organization that they feel very strongly about, then I would say the second easy way is to do um, is to do the don uh, the repeatable donation, right? And so uh, the, even if ten or fifteen dollars a month, fifteen dollars every single month, it's 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 you know ten dollars, ten to fifteen dollars just a lunch out. 
So uh -huh. you can easily miss one lunch out to go give money to Karama, but it's really for, but it's getting people to understand and appreciate the value that Karama is providing. It, uh -huh. it may not be providing it to them, but getting them to buy into this idea of the benefit that's available for the larger good and for the larger community. Uh -huh the education that we're providing and, and you know, through uh, references and what uh, resource availability, all of that. So I think it's, it's first and first is getting people to buy into your idea, into your concept. And mm -hmm. once they get there and say, like, okay, well, how do I donate? How can I help? Well, here's an easy way. Set you up as a repeater. So you only have to do it once, set you up once, and then it's repeatable every time, every month. And they don't, and 10 to $15, no one feels, I should say no one. Most people don't feel a dent of giving 10 to $15 a month. So that it's not a huge hit on them, but we benefit on the long run. And it, it's, it's um, amplified with the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. if, if one person done it, does it, that's $10. If you get 10 people to do it, that's $100 right there. And it's, it's, yep. it, it just multiplies very quickly. Hmm. Right. Well, okay, Karama alumni who are listening to this, you have your marching orders from our treasurer. <laughs> Go out and become repeat don donors at 10 or $15 a month. We need the money, and I do believe we're providing the services. Oh, well, this was very exciting, including be getting my uh, connection interrupted. It's going to look funny on the recording. But I am back, and I wanted to thank you so much, Noreen. I know you're terribly busy these days, so just being able to get 30, 35, 40 minutes of your time is very precious to us. And uh, before closing, I just wanted to put in a couple of quick plugs, as you all know. Our next Lunch and Learn session will be Thursday, the 24th of September. And our guest will be Dr. Zena Balwani, Associate Professor at the Harvard University School of Divinity and a longtime supporter and board member of Karama. Most of you know Dr. Alwani is a very popular lecturer uh, at our law and leadership program. I am trying to persuade her to lead a halaqa for Karama. If you'd like to participate in a halaqa, please let us know via email to alumni at karama.org. If we get between 20 to 30 people who are interested in participating, perhaps Dr. Alwani can be per persuaded. Um, and if you haven't already done so, please visit our YouTube channel and listen to her series on Ummahat al-Mu'mineen. And um, one final plug, a lot of people uh, at the uh, end of the LLP this year expressed an interest uh, in participating in a longer, more fleshed out conflict resolution uh, webinar, series of webinars. And what I can tell you is that uh, Dr. Abdullah is definitely interested in participating and uh, stay tuned. Um, you may soon be receiving a notice uh, to the alumni about uh, an upcoming three, maybe four uh, session program on conflict resolution with Dr. Amr Abdullah. You have spoken and we are trying to listen and respond and really do write to us at alumni at uh, karama.org because we're trying very much to understand what it is that you want us to give you so that we can give it to you and also to give us an opportunity to explain who we are so that you can share that information with other people and that way Karama can, can grow and thrive. And thank you all very much for coming and thank Rahma for being our, our behind the scenes operator here. <laughs> thank you.